When I was in high school, I was something of an outsider. I smoked pot and listened to heavy metal music, and I had a chip on my shoulder about the Christian right wing in America. I was a smart kid, but I didn't know anything, and I'm lucky I didn't get into any serious trouble. I had a countercultural streak, but I had a conscience. I wasn't an anarchist. I was a natural liberal from the time I came of age. Back then, in the 90s, there were debates about teaching creationism in the biology classroom. The Republican Party represented the conservation of traditional Christian family values, a code for preventing gay couples from getting married. They favored hard sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. They wanted transgressive books banned. They favored the death penalty. They aspired to overturn Roe v. Wade. They wanted low taxes for the rich, low environmental regulations for big business, and fewer services for the poor and disenfranchised. I disagreed with them pretty well across the board. George W. Bush represented everything I didn't want in our leadership, and naturally I opposed the invasion of Iraq. While in college in the early 2000s, I went to see Michael Moore when he visited campus. His political position seemed to be the direct opposite of the Republican mainstream. He was a kind of Bernie Sanders socialist, a working class populist who was rallying for good wages, health care, and peace. Since I've been an adult, gays and lesbians have gained the right to marry, Marijuana has been legalized in many states, including this one, and the Iraq war has been accepted by pretty much everyone to have been a mistake, if not downright illegal and wrong. A major focus of the Obama administration was about extending health care benefits to all citizens. There can be a debate about whether Obamacare is good policy, whether it achieves its stated goal, the cost of insurance premiums, prescription drugs, whatever. At least when we were debating health care, just as when we were debating marriage rights for gay people, we were talking about something of consequence to securing the liberty and prosperity of Americans. College campuses tend to be left-wing places on the whole. The educated and ambitious youth have always pushed back against war and oppression. In the 1960s, the anti-Vietnam War movement and the Civil Rights Movement, both driven by liberal principles, were accompanied by the massive free speech movement centered at Berkeley. The right-wing backlash against the Berkeley free speech protest is credited with helping Ronald Reagan become governor of California in 1966. This episode is different from any that I have ever done before. It's not about the problem of consciousness, but it does directly concern the state of academic science. I have some preliminary statements to make, and it is vital that you hear them. If you are a listener of this podcast, then you are familiar with my style and to a great extent my values. I know that I am an imperfect communicator, and I do not want to be misunderstood. I estimate that the vast majority of American citizens, including college students, are of a generally liberal disposition. I'm not talking about liberalism with a big L, as in left-wing politics. I am talking about the principles of civil rights, equality, democracy, the separation of powers, and the scientific method. These are essentially enlightenment values. American right-wing views are a kind of amalgam between liberalism and Christianity. Common right-wing values include the right to bear arms and free markets. American left-wing views tend toward an amalgam of liberalism and socialism. Common left-wing priorities are abortion rights and voting rights, for example. The left-wing tends to favor universal health care, environmental protections, and a social safety net. I'm pretty sympathetic to these ideas. The right prefers to keep the federal government small and out of our business, at least in principle. In general, across the American mainstream, there is respect for equality under the law, presumed innocence, freedom of the press, freedom of association, and representative democracy. Believe it or not, Americans have a lot in common with one another. The commonality is based in large part on a common belief in liberal principles. The substantive disagreements tend to revolve around competing priorities within the liberal order. The reason this is not obvious is that the media favoring each side presents an exaggerated straw man in order to gain public support for their side. Since there are competing interests in a free society, it becomes necessary to argue different sides of the issues, and good people can disagree. If you are interested in science and philosophy, as you probably are if you're listening to this, then you are at least implicitly in favor of liberalism. 
I am quite sure that a majority of college students have respect for science as a means of ascertaining truth. Furthermore, respect for civil rights is nearly universal among students of recent generations. The American left wing has largely been responsible for this cultural shift. We have learned that so long as our society is grounded in a, grounded in a deep commitment to liberal principles across the board, those principles can be used democratically to bend the arc of history toward justice. Given this track record of American liberal progression, what is the emerging left-wing backlash against liberalism which is now evident in the media, online, and on college campuses? In the name of science, scientific questions are not allowed to be asked. Rather than speaking truth to power, the media wields power to suppress the truth. In the name of political liberalism, the principles of liberty must be overturned. It looks to me as if these student movements are aimed in the opposite direction of their predecessors. Rather than pushing the boundaries further into the cultural frontier as courageous young people have always done, a growing number of activists are now standing against free speech and academic freedom, demanding to be protected against liberty. This is in effect a protest against the right to protest. In an essay called Of the Liberty of Thought and Discussion, John Stuart Mill wrote, quote, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. Were an opinion a personal possession of no value except to the owner, if to be obstructed in the enjoyment of it were simply a private injury, it would make some difference whether the injury was inflicted only on a few persons or on many. But the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it is robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion still more than those who hold it. If the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. If wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error." Unquote. There's a lot I don't know and I enjoy talking to all kinds of people. I would not make the arrogant statement that critical theory has nothing to offer to the intellectual conversation, but I would strongly argue that the good faith conversation is being prevented. When I do see critical theorists engaged in debate, I notice that their approach, in the critical tradition, is to attempt to discredit the moral credibility of their opponents rather than to establish the errors in the opposing point of view. Maybe I'm out of touch. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm willing to learn, to entertain new ideas, but I'm not going to abandon my principles on the basis of blackmail. In Critical Race Theory and Introduction, Richard Delgado and Jean Stefansik explain, quote, Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, Enlightenment, Rationalism, and Neutral Principles of Constitutional Law." Unquote. This is a direct opposition to the heroes of the Enlightenment, the scientific method, and the preaching of Dr. Martin Luther King. The insiders, the critical theorists themselves, know this. Are they afraid to come out and say so? This was reported in the Washington Free Beacon on March 16th. Quote, More than 100 students at Yale Law School attempted to shout down a bipartisan panel on civil liberties intimidating attendees and causing so much chaos that police were eventually called to escort panelists out of the building. The March 10 panel, which was hosted by the Yale Federalist Society, featured Monica Miller of the Progressive American Humanist Association and Kristen Wagoner of the Alliance Defending Freedom, a conservative nonprofit that promotes religious liberty. Both groups had taken the same side in a 2021 Supreme Court case involving legal remedies for First Amendment violations. The purpose of the panel, a member of the Federalist Society said, was to illustrate that a liberal atheist and a conservative Christian could find common ground on free speech issues." Unquote. Reportedly, the majority of the student body side with the protesters. Notice that this event was not even about a controversial topic which some students might find offensive. Apparently, the students are offended by free speech itself. I can only assume that the students at Yale Law School are influenced by critical theory. They are thus not committed to liberalism and ideologically oppose it. Either that, or they are living in a campus culture that is so terrifying and censorious that they feel that they have to be seen to support it so as not to become its next target. My guess is that it's the latter. 
I have no doubt that these law students and their professors are intelligent people, but so am I. Maybe Karl Marx and the Frankfurt School have something important to teach modern society which I have not yet grasped. Maybe you, listener, have an understanding of critical theory which convinces you of its merit. If you do, then talk to me. Stop insulting well-meaning liberals with allegations of bad character. I'm not a political conservative, but I'm not on board with what is happening right now on the left. Attempts to shut down free discourse just make it clear to me that this critical strain of leftism is unable to muster a convincing argument. Or perhaps the leading activists understand that they would immediately become unpopular once they were seen to oppose the liberal values held by the larger student body. The stated purpose of critical theory is to eliminate domination and oppression. Good. I don't like domination and oppression either. I stand in opposition to the current left-wing cultural climate exactly on those grounds. I see it as an attempt to seize power by means of domination and oppression. The committed critical theorists might be okay with that, but I don't think the wider academic community will be. The reason is that the American academic community, grounded in the liberal arts, is actually opposed to domination and oppression. Well, all of this doesn't bode well for the future of science, at least not for the near future. Take, for example, the previous episode in which I talked about personality disorders. The discipline of psychology lacks a clear understanding of mental illnesses, such as borderline disorder, bipolar depression, eating disorders, and addiction. But recent decades have shown marked progress in the development of treatments which change lives for the better, in life-saving ways. How easy would it be to shut this inquiry down on the grounds that it is neurotypical bigotry? In diagnosing and treating these disorders, are psychologists not erasing the identities of their patients? Can we study gender dysphoria? Activists often point out the high rate of suicide in this population. It's a serious problem. Can we help these people? Do we care to? Or would that be engaged in cis-normativity and transphobia? What about the problem of the underrepresentation of females in a lot of studies, even in animal studies? I know a lot of neuroscience researchers who are addressing this by studying sex differences. Will this important work be obstructed? Based upon what I have heard critical gender theorists say, mentioning biological sex differences is hate speech. Obesity was identified by epidemiologists as a major contributor to COVID mortality. But isn't that fat phobia? If fatness, deafness, blindness, and paraplegia are identities, then all of the fine research in spinal cord regeneration, recovery of sight, and the contributions to cancer and heart disease risk are doing violence to the identities of the very people they've made their careers in service to. We learned in the previous century of the association between smoking tobacco and diseases such as cancer and emphysema. This has led to a massive reduction in smoking in this country. That information has saved countless lives. No one claims being a smoker as an identity that needs protecting. Suppose we want to evaluate the effectiveness of teaching strategies in education. Can we do that? Or is it racist to test students on their learning? I hope you get my point. I'll make one final one. The scientific method itself will be called Eurocentric, even white supremacist, because it is held above other so-called ways of knowing. Do you honestly suppose that these extremist positions could be understood and deeply held by the broad youth of America? There is no way. The greater student population is interested in expanding liberty to people that they perceive to be disenfranchised, not throwing out liberty altogether. The greater student population has compassion for people suffering from mental illness, infectious disease, and addiction, and it couldn't be more obvious that scientific research is the means to help. So how is this trick being pulled off? Conformity is not an option in science. It is antithetical to the method. We don't even conform to our own opinions. Classically, we form hypotheses and test them under conditions designed to disprove them. Then we change our opinion subject to the evidence. In the absence of evidence, it is not scientifically valid to do a poll of experts in the field and consider the matter settled if a large majority share a common hypothesis. Such polls are often referred to as the scientific consensus. That's not how science operates. The key to good science is to come up with plausible alternative hypotheses and to cleverly devise experiments that will clearly distinguish among them. We do this in our own work and also when we evaluate the work of others as peer reviewers. Thankfully, the quality and honesty of scientific communication is a lot stronger in the peer-reviewed literature than it is when presented by the media. The conclusions which are presented in the primary literature are generally limited, with important caveats discussed by the authors. 
Peer review is responsible for much of dishonesty, as overconfident conclusions are not tolerated. The papers that make a big splash in the scientific community are those that are either novel, in that they present something not previously studied, or counterintuitive, arriving at a result which experts of the public do not expect. This is the way it's supposed to work. But the current social climate presents a threat to the process of objective scientific investigation. A study could fail to get funding, fail to get published, and fail to come to light due to these pressures in any case where there is a cultural or political bias at play. And in the case of such studies being conducted, with results that go against what the activist cultural narrative demands, books will be banned, speakers disinvited, and departments will be pressured to censure or get rid of the researchers who have done the work. Are scientists so confused as to be anti-scientific? No, I don't think so. Rather, a vocal activism on campus and social media will threaten the publisher, the venue, or the university leadership. Often these parties buckle under the pressure that their own reputations could be tarnished, or they don't want to pay for security to protect the safety of the speaker and her audience, or they don't want to lose their jobs, or have an angry mob chasing them down the corridor. They will be called racist, or homophobic, or colonialist, or whatever is the latest slander of the day. Why does this matter so much to them? Mostly because they're devoted to the principles of liberalism, whether they lean politically left or politically right. For what it's worth, like me, the vast majority of academics lean left. They aren't racist or homophobic or any of that. They despise racism and homophobia. They have no beef with transgender students or political protests on campus. This is so much the case that they can't stand for society to think such things of them. There is something obscene about a room full of liberals terrified into silence to declare themselves so. On an American college campus of all places. Here's an excerpt from an article called Critical Theory by Christian Fuchs. Quote, Critical theory rejects the argument that academia and science should and can be value-free. It rather argues that all thought and theories are shaped by political worldviews. The reason why a person is interested in a certain topic, aligns himself or herself with a certain school of thought, develops a particular theory and not another one, refers to certain authors and not others, are deeply political because modern society is shaped by conflicts of interest and therefore, for surviving and asserting themselves, scholars have to make choices, either strategic, enter strategic alliances and defend their positions against others. In conflict-based and antagonistic societies, academic writing and speaking, scholarship and science are therefore always forms of political communication. They are not just discovery, knowledge construction, or invention, but besides knowledge creation, also a production and communication of knowledge about knowledge, the political standpoints of the scholars themselves. Critical theory holds not only that theory is always political, but also that it should develop analyses of society and concepts that assist struggle against interests and ideas that justify domination and exploitation." Unquote. This framing of scientific communication is deeply political and antagonistic is incredibly cynical. My mentors in biomedical neuroscience have devoted their careers to solving important problems on behalf of society. Let's see, genetic epilepsy, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, diabetic neuropathy, post-traumatic stress disorder. These investigations are obviously aimed at the betterment of lives. So what about basic science? When I developed my theory of consciousness, I was not engaging in politics. I was addressing a difficult and compelling problem in the best, to the best of my analytical ability. And far from entering strategic alliances, I was pointing out the flaws of the leading theories in the field. I find the assertion of scientific speech is necessarily political outrageous. Nevertheless, according to critical gender theory, I was secretly engaged in the justification of male dominance. According to critical race theory, I was secretly engaged in oppression of non-whites. According to critical queer theory, I was attempting to establish cis-normative domination. This is absurd on its face, and any person of honesty could see it. The only threat that the investigation of human consciousness could be accused of is an attempt to discover the reality of the subjective individual, which supports a liberal view of ultimate equality and moral value of conscious beings a focus which undermines the legitimacy and identitarian collectivism in favor of humanitarian empathy and the unifying existential commonality of being. I didn't set out to make that case, but it's sort of the upshot of the existence of conscious beings in a shared universe. 
Okay, keep in mind the point I related in the quoted passage above that all academic and scientific speech is political communication. The author writes, quote, Hegel and Marx's concept of dialectics can help scholars to understand the fundamentally contradictory character of, commi of political communication in modern society. Political communication does not just communicate interests, but communicates such interests due to the antagonistic structure of modern society in opposition to somebody. Critical scholarship analyzes political communication by identifying political contradictions and the ways in which these contradictions are communicated in public or ideologically masked and distorted." Unquote. You see, all scientific speech is political communication, and all political communication is oppositional to somebody. Whichever identity group the critical theorists claim to work on behalf of, that is the somebody in question. According to this, a new hypothesis is not tested in opposition to other hypotheses. Rather, it is an attack on somebody's identity. One final passage from Fuchs, quote, Critical theory is a critique of domination and exploitation. Critical theory questions all thought and practices that justify or uphold domination and exploitation. Marx formulated the categoric imperative of critical theory. It is the categoric imperative to overthrow all contradictions in which man is degraded, enslaved, neglected, and contemptible being. Unquote. Fair enough. I don't like slavery and degradation and contempt. But wait a minute. The previous two passages establish the following logic. All scientific speech is political speech. All political speech is in opposition to somebody. That opposition is a form of domination and degradation. And all forms of domination and degradation must be overthrown. Thus, free speech, scientific or otherwise, must be overthrown. It's that simple. That's how the sausage is made. Y'all hungry? This is from the first source I was using, the textbook called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. Quote, Crits are also highly suspicious of another liberal mainstay, namely rights. Particularly some of the older, more radical CRT scholars, with roots in racial realism and an economic view of history, believe that moral and legal rights are apt to do the right holder much less good than many would like to think. Rights are almost always procedural, for example, to a fair process, rather than substantive, for example, to food, housing, or education. This is how our system applauds affording everyone equality of opportunity, but resists programs that assure equality of results." Unquote. Equality of results. That's what the word equity means. If they just came out and said equality of results, everyone would clearly see that critical theory is Marxism. But I thought the media fact checker said it wasn't Marxism. I thought they said that it was cons that was a conservative talking point. Yep, they were lying. They get away with this by saying that Marx was focused on class inequality. Critical theory is about race, or gender, or whatever. Right. Quick question. Isn't the goal of critical theory to overthrow capitalism in favor of a communist utopia? Well, yeah, but case closed. That's Marxism. For the record, I found this article by Christian Fuchs on Google. It was the first comprehensive review of critical theory that I came across. I did a quick word count in the document. The word Marx is mentioned 52 times. It appears on every single page. Marx's approach was referred to as critical consciousness, becoming perceptive of social and political contradictions. I think his mistake was to miss the contradictions in his own prescription. Let me be really clear. I don't have a problem with people reading Marx or studying critical theory or anything like that. You're in college. Read everything you can get your hands on, fearlessly. Imagine a place where young people would be confronted with the varied philosophical, economic, and political views of the intellectual past and present, would undertake vigorous debate, would have their opinions challenged and honed, would become informed and cultured, would become actualized individuals. Imagine a university. This is the closest I've ever looked into critical theory. Today's public service announcement is entirely in reaction to the recent events at Yale. I have no interest in turning this podcast into a political program. Moreover, my liberal position here is not a partisan one. It's a philosophical one. My conscience demands that I stick my neck out where I have the capacity to do so. I'm currently looking for a long-term faculty position focused on teaching undergraduates. I should be afraid that speaking openly about this topic is dangerous to my academic employability. I know that. But the truth which has become abundantly clear to me is that if current illiberal left-wing movements continue uncontested, I won't be able to teach science and liberal arts on campus anyway. I understand the frustration that young people feel when they learn about injustices and inequality. I really do. I think critical theories are becoming influential because they explicitly take up these important concerns. 
They offer a worldview which establishes an enemy to fight against and a method for doing so. It employs a dialectical method for identifying contradictions as a means of social criticism. These contradictions are real. For example, slavery, segregation, and redlining are offensive and intolerable precisely because they are inconsistent with liberalism. Totalitarian societies across the world, Libya, North Korea, China, they literally exercise these abominations today. There is no reason to believe that overthrowing our common liberal principles would solve our problems, and there is plenty of reason to expect the exact opposite. According to what I have shared with you, critical theory claims to fight oppression, unfair domination, and ideology. Those are worthwhile aims. In the wider culture, critical theory has just burst into the mainstream. And the first thing it appears to have hastened to accomplish is to obtain ideological domination by means of authoritarian oppression. That's rich, isn't it? I suggest that liberals begin to apply Marx's dialectical method to make the case against critical theory. Its contradictions are blatant. Let's call this approach critical critical studies and see how they like it. If the scientific leadership on our university campuses would just stand up and defend the liberalism they believe in, a massive body of relieved students would follow their lead, and we could all get back to work making progress toward equality, liberty, and justice that ex extends to everybody. We could stop enabling the architects of our undoing. We could pursue truth without looking over our shoulder to ensure the thought police don't catch us in the act. It's not that the kids have lost their mind, though. It's that the adults have lost their nerve. I'll close with a story recounted by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who exposed the horrors of the Soviet Union in his book, The Gulag Archipelago. Quote, a district party conference was underway in Moscow province. It was presided over by a new secretary of the district party committee, replacing one recently arrested. At the conclusion of the conference, a tribute to comrade Stalin was called for. Of course, everyone stood up, just as everyone had had leaped to his feet during the conference at every mention of his name. The small hall echoed with stormy applause, rising to an ovation. For three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, the stormy applause rising to an ovation continued. But palms were getting sore and raised arms were already aching, and the older people were panting from exhaustion. It was becoming insufferably silly, even to those who really adored Stalin. However, who would dare be the first to stop? The secretary of the district party committee, could have done it. He was standing on the platform, and it was he who had just called for the ovation. But he was a newcomer. He had taken the place of a man who had been arrested. He was afraid. After all, NKVD men were standing in the hall, applauding and watching to see who quit first. And in that obscure small hall, unknown to the leader, the applause went on. Six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could, of course, cheat a bit. Clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly, but up there with the presidium where everyone could see them? The director of the local paper factory, an independent and strong-minded man, stood with the presidium. Aware of all the falsity and all the impossibility of the situation, he still kept on applauding. Nine minutes, ten. In anguish, he watched the secretary of the district party committee, but the latter dared not stop. Insanity. To the last man with make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope. The district leaders were just going to go on and on applauding, till they fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers, and even then, those who were left would not falter. Then, after eleven minutes, the director of the paper factory assumed a business-like expression and sat down in his seat. And, oh, a miracle took place. Where had the universal, uninhibited, indescribable enthusiasm gone? To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down. They had been saved. The squirrel had been smart enough to jump off his revolving wheel. That, however, was how they discovered who the independent people were. And that was how they went about eliminating them. That same night, the factory director was arrested. They easily pasted ten years on him on the pretext of something quite different. But after he had signed Form 206, the final document of the interrogation, his interrogator reminded him, Don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Unquote. I'm not clapping, are you?